Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the Office of National Drug Control Policy today for a webinar on address addressing opioid overdose and opioid use disorder through hospitals. Now I would like to hand off to our moderator, Peter Gomond. Thank you, Emily. And good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Hospitals are an essential part of our response to the opioid crisis. However, responding effectively to opioid overdose and to opi opioid use disorder in emergency departments or other hospital settings can be challenging. This webinar follows and builds upon a similar webinar ONDCP conducted on August 5th of this year. The earlier webinar featured approaches in Rhode Island, Washington County, Pennsylvania, and at Yale New Haven Hospital. This first webinar focused specifically on approaches based in emergency departments, while today's session features approaches that also include other hospital settings. Demand for the August 5th webinar was such that we reached our capacity limit and had to close registration. Because of the demand for more information on how emergency departments and other hospital-affiliated settings can effectively respond to the opioid crisis, ONDCP organized today's session, which features three additional approaches. We are fortunate that our expert presenters for both the August 5th webinar and this one have agreed to make themselves available for informal consultation. They have also agreed to establish a learning community or community of practice if there is demand for it. We'll provide information about these resources at the end of today's webinar. We will be posting a recording of today's webinar to the ONDCP YouTube channel. Once the recording has been posted, we will email you a link to it as well as a link to the recording of the August 5th session. Today's session features groundbreaking work taking place at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, Boston Medical Center, and Massachusetts General Hospital. Director of National Drug Control Policy Michael Botticelli will open our session today. He will be followed by Dr. Diana Coffa, Associate Professor, Family and Community Medicine, and Director of the San Francisco General Hospital, University of California, San Francisco Family and Community Medicine Res Residency Program. After Dr. Coffa, Dr. Edward Bernstein will present. He is Professor and Vice Chair for Academic Affairs in the Department of Emergency Medicine of the Boston University School of Medicine and he is director of the Faster Paths to Treatment Initiative at Boston Medical Center, as well as being professor of community health sciences at the Boston University School of Public Health. And finally, Dr. Sarah Wakeman, medical director for substance use disorders at the Massachusetts General Hospital Center for Community Health Improvement, is also an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and she will present on their activities. Now, uh, I have the honor of introducing Michael Botticelli, Director of National Drug C Control Policy at the White House. Mr. O Mr. Botticelli leads the Obama Administration's drug policy efforts, which have been based on a balanced public health and public safety approach. He is the first person to serve as Director of National Drug Control Policy who has a public health and substance use disorder treatment background. He is also the first to hold this title who is openly in recovery. Director Botticelli is a passionate advocate for science-based policy, a champion of efforts to address the national opioid epidemic, a leader in our efforts to reduce stigma and misunderstanding associated with substance use and substance use disorders, and a powerful voice for recovery. We're fortunate to have him here. Director Botticelli? Great. Thanks, Peter. And thanks, everybody, uh, for being on the call today. And I'd like to especially thank our presenters today. Uh, I think the response that we've had to the previous webinar and this webinar is a really good indication that this is a significant area of interest and opportunity for all of us to work together. Uh, probably all of you on the call pro uh, saw the CDC 2015 mortality data that were released last week that showed our numbers of uh, opioid deaths continue to escalate uh, in just about every region of the United States and, and just about in every state. So uh, uh, on average, 144 people 
uh, in 2015 died every day from a drug overdose. And we're continuing to see the escalation of opioid overdose deaths that involve heroin and fentanyl, um, which has really challenged us. I think that we've been, um, I think many of you have been involved in efforts across the country to increase access to naloxone, and we're seeing more and more people uh, revive from their overdoses uh, with naloxone, and that's, uh, that's really great and it's really promising. But we have to continue to focus on uh, how we move people uh, into treatment uh, from overdose or from an opioid use disorder um, so that we can make sure that get help and get into uh, recovery. You know, one, one of the areas that I think is uh, important uh, to talk about is the treatment gap that we have uh, in the United States. And, you know, unfortunately only one in nine people are getting treatment for a substance use disorder. And this is really uh, an issue for all of us to, uh, to work on. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but we want to make sure that people who uh, do overdose go to the emergency department or in our hospitals because of a substance use disorder are, are, are ensured that they're getting some level of, of guidance uh, and support to get into treatment, not just for their overdose, but for their underlying substance use disorder. And those of you who are working in hospitals, I think have a real opportunity to make a difference. You know, for all of the emergency physicians, hospitalists, and nurses on the call, we know that there's tremendous pressure on you uh, and you're often stretched thin. But we have to make sure that we are doing everything we can uh, to make sure that we are moving people and increasing the probability that people will get into treatment. You know, we've done this for patients who are who have cardiac arrest or trauma, that we're doing everything we can, not just to resuscitate and stabilize them, but making sure that they're getting linked into treatment and rehabilitative services. Uh, we know we often need a diverse and comprehensive team to respond effectively, including emergency room physicians, first responders, primary care practitioners, addiction specialists, substance use disorder treatment providers, uh, recovery coaches, and recovery community organizations. And you'll hear today from people who are doing, I think, some really exciting work around the country uh, about successfully linking people uh, to treatment. You know, one of the issues that I've heard for a very long time from particularly emergency departments is the lack of treatment capacity in their area. And I think all of you know that uh, this administration has been working very hard to make sure that we expand access to treatment. Uh, earlier in the year, the President called on Congress for $1 billion in new funding to address the opioid epidemic, particularly in areas where treatment is very hard to find or isn't available. And uh, last week, I'm very happy to say the plan became a reality when he signed the 21st Century Cures Act. This law offers grants to states based on the number of people who have an unmet need for treatment and the number of drug poisoning deaths. Uh, SAMHSA has put out that funding uh, opportunity application recently uh, and we'll be awarding money to states uh, as soon as we can. We want this funding to make an appreciable dent in the epidemic in your states. Um, and also happy to say that one of the allowable uses for these grant dollars is connecting individuals with opioid use disorders and those who have overdosed to treatment uh, through various settings, uh, particularly uh, through hospitals. So these grants can be used to support better transitions to treatment. Uh, and so I encourage you to work with your single state authorities on substance use services. The application will go through them uh, for how they are proposing to use the money. So, you know, if we're going to turn this crisis around, we need everyone engaged, law enforcement, but we particularly need the medical community to become more engaged in this issue. We also need to continue to break the stigma and correct the misunderstanding associated with substance use disorders and medication-assisted treatment so that more people can access evidence-based treatment and get their lives back in order. Uh, this is truly a life or death matter, and the data released last week really underscore the urgency of our need for enhanced action on this. So we know that ending this epidemic and the spread of this uh, issue will really take everyone working together, from the president to our local leaders and local city council members, from medical professionals and our law and each of you who are watching this webinar today. And as you're listening, I encourage you to think about what you can do to help connect individuals who overdose to treatment and, by our extension, move our country from crisis to recovery. So today's discussion doesn't end here, though. You'll receive information, as Peter said, 
how to request informal consultation from today's presenters and from other experts who are doing groundbreaking work to address the opioid epidemic through emergency departments, inpatient units, and other hospital-affiliated settings. So I really want to thank you for being engaged and committed to make a difference, and I really challenge you to do your part to help people get treatment and find recovery. So thanks, everybody, for being on the call, and thanks for our presenters for the work that you're doing. Thank you, Director Botticelli. And uh, now we're going to hand the floor over to our first panelist, Dr. Diana Coffa, who will uh, talk about the work underway at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Dr. Coffa? Thank you. So it's it's really a pleasure and an honor to be speaking today, and I do want to thank everyone on this call for taking the time to be here. I know that everybody here is busy. Um, I also want to acknowledge that over 1,200 people are registered for this call, which means that there are for over 1,200 questions probably and 1,200 perspectives and 1,200 sets of issues. And so I read over the questions that some of you uh, submitted in advance. And it became clear that we really do have participants from many different places and perspectives. So as the first of three speakers, what I'm really going to focus on doing is getting us all on the same page about the current state of the evidence, lay the basic ground for work for what we could be doing to treat opioid use disorders in the hospital setting. And I'll be doing that, of course, in the context of describing our work at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, which I'm going to call VSFG from now on because that's a lot of syllables. Um, next slide. So first, I want to just lay some contextual framework for how we've integrated opioid use disorder treatment into our clinical setting. So when I talk about the work we do in the hospital, I inevitably have to talk about the work that we're doing throughout the San Francisco Health Network, which is the clinical arm of the San Francisco Department of We can't provide good addiction treatment in the hospital if we're not creating effective long-term discharge plans for people. Um, and so our system is really kind of obsessed with integration. Every innovation we make around substance use disorder treatment in the hospital begins with figuring out how we're going to integrate it with a community treatment system. So I think this is why it's so important what Director Botticelli said, that we have a, a larger system of treatment in place to which we can refer people. Next slide. Another reason we're so committed to integration in our system is that it allows innovations to spread faster throughout the system. So in our, in our program, we have assiduously avoided developing specialty addiction services in our hospital and in our outpatient clinics. Instead, we kind of insist on making substance use disorder treatment part of the scope of practice of every provider in our system. So we don't want to carve it out and make it a separate service. We want to make it part of what everybody does. That way, good ideas don't get stuck in one siloed program, but they actually spread throughout the system. Next slide. Now, you may have heard in the introduction that I'm an educator. I'm a family medicine residency program director. So I'm particularly committed to this notion of integration because I want to make sure that every single one of my graduates understands that substance use treatment is part of their scope of practice and that every patient they see from here forward, whether it's in the clinic, they need to ask about alcohol, they need to ask about drug use. And I want to make sure they develop the skills throughout their training to actually address those issues effectively. So again, we avoid making the, pur it the purview of a specialty service and we, we integrate substance use treatment into everything that people do in our system so they can learn it. Next slide. And lastly, as many of you know, full integration reduces the stigma associated with substance use treatment. By including substance use treatment in the regular medical care of folks who are admitted for cellulitis or who are being treated for diabetes, we normalize the treatment of the disease. So instead of sending the message that you need to go to a special secret clinic and sign special secret paperwork, um, we let people know that this is just this is part of what we do when we're taking care of people. Next slide. So having set that framework that we're sort of integration obsessed in our, in our setting, uh, I want to share with you, with you some of the specific programs that we've rolled out here at CSFG. So just looking at the top row of this table, we're going to be talking about methadone in initiation and linkage to maintenance. Buprenorphine initiation and maintenance, naloxone for overdose reversal, and screening and brief intervention. 
And just a quick note, because this came up in the questions that were submitted, we do not in our system recommend or endorse short courses of methadone or buprenorphine for detox or medical assist withdrawal. The evidence does not support the efficacy of detoxes, and we know that patients are overwhelmingly likely to relapse at the end of the taper. So what we're recommending is long-term treatment, we're talking years to lifetime treatment. And so when we talk about methadone or buprenorphine initiation in the hospital, we're not talking about detoxes. We're talking about setting them up with long-term care. Next slide. Okay, so about five years ago, this was our state at ZSFG. We were providing buprenorphine maintenance in the family medicine clinic and in the internal medicine clinic. We were prescribing naloxone for overdose reversal to anyone receiving long-term opioids. And we were providing screening and brief intervention. We were also fortunate enough to have a methadone clinic on campus that allowed us to initiate methadone for hospitalized patients. So if a patient came to the hospital for endocarditis, for example, and wanted to stop injecting heroin, we had a protocol that, could, protocol that guided us through a slow methadone induction in the hospital. The day before discharge, we would call the methadone clinic and let them know we had a new patient, and then on the day of discharge, they would actually take that patient in for intake that day. It was an incredibly smooth system, and we're actually quite fortunate that it remains in place. But that's the kind of integration that we've found we really need to have to develop effective systems. So that's where we were a few years ago. And then in 2010, the mother study came out. So Andre Jones and her team showed that not only was buprenorphine safe in pregnancy, but it reduced the duration and severity of neonatal abstinence syndrome among newborns. Next slide. So we put together a team of family physicians, obstetricians, and anesthesiologists and developed a protocol for buprenorphine induction in pregnancy and for labor management on buprenorphine. And we've been providing buprenorphine for pregnant women since then. Then in 2014, a study was published showing that patients could be safely started on buprenorphine while they were in the hospital for other acute issues. Next slide. So we immediately put together another team, this time with outpatient clinic leaders and inpatient hospital leadership, to develop a protocol for inpatient induction and for discharge planning of hospitalized patients. So for the last year now, we've been offering patients who are hospitalized for acute medical issues and want to stop opioids two choices. They can choose methadone or buprenorphine, and we can support them in either one. We also, you can see the third dot in this row, we also began prescribing naloxone for overdose reversal to all of our high-risk patients, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Then in 2015, Gail D'Onofrio and her team published a study showing that you can safely start buprenorphine in the emergency room. So right now, one of our toxicology fellows is working with Craig Smolin, one of the physicians in our emergency department, to develop a protocol for uh, inpatient buprenorphine, or emergency room buprenorphine induction in our system. Next slide. Our emergency department has also been prescribing naloxone for overdose prevention for about a year now. And again, we'll talk about the, that a little more uh, in a few minutes. So having looked at an overview of the programs that we have, I want to talk about the structures that we put in place to help buprenorphine prescribing become standard practice throughout our system. Next slide. First, we provide a lot of training. So twice a year, we offer a free buprenorphine training on the hospital campus. It's required for all the family medicine residents. And of course, the family medicine residents rotate through many of the services in the hospital. So they are in the emergency room, and they're in the OB floor, and they're in the um, adult inpatient unit. And so they carry this knowledge of buprenorphine with them all around the hospital, kind of pollinating the hospital with this, with this service. Um, we invite faculty, nurse practitioners, any healthcare professional who wants to come to the training, we bring them on board. We include residents from any residency that's willing to send their residents, as well as fellows. So we try to cast a very wide net in terms of educating people about buprenorphine. Next slide. Next, we've instituted a buprenorphine consultation teacher. So I said earlier that we've avoided developing a specialty service that took over the care of patients. Instead, the buprenorphine consult coaches physicians over the phone, supporting them in managing buprenorphine and helping them work through any issues that might come up. 
So I personally carry the buprenorphine consultation pager a fair bit, and I do a lot of just helping people think through whether they've chosen the right medication for the patient, what kinds of dose changes they need to make, and certainly thinking through insurance and discharge planning issues. Next slide. We've made the pager available to all of the services in the hospital. So we get calls from the outpatient clinics um, when they have particularly complex cases they need help with. Um, we get most of our calls at this point actually from the labor and delivery floor. Uh, we're seeing more and more pregnant women who are wanting to start buprenorphine and our obstetricians aren't yet totally familiar with it and so we spend a fair bit of time coaching and helping them um, figure out their inductions. In fact, we started to get calls from other hospitals in San Francisco that aren't even part of our system. So I get calls from labor and delivery units especially um, from, from hospitals throughout the city because they're starting to see women show up on buprenorphine and they're not sure what to do with it. So it's been a really useful service to be able to provide. Next slide. And now for those of you who work in systems that don't have a buprenorphine pager, which is probably most, most of you, um, I do want to let you know about a service that we do provide that's nationally available. So the UCSF Department of Family and Community Medicine runs a national substance use warm line the numbers on here. So providers from anywhere in the country can call with any questions that you have around caring for people with substance use disorder. We're mostly targeting um, outpatient primary care providers, but we welcome calls from anyone who needs help with these issues. You should also know about the PCSS MAT system, which is another national system that provides support specifically for buprenorphine providers. Next slide. Okay, so now I want to show you how we guide providers who are doing inpatient inductions in our system. Next slide. Once a physician identifies a patient with opioid use disorder who's interested in treatment, the physician pulls up the buprenorphine prescribing guide. And here, here's the first page of the prescribing guide. Next slide. The guide provides a list of indications and contraindications to help providers feel confident that they're making good medical decisions. It then provides a decision support table that guides providers in talking through the pros and cons of methadone versus buprenorphine with patients. The guide instructs providers to call the buprenorphine pager so that we can coach them through the process. It provides an algorithm to walk them through the induction, and it provides a discharge planning checklist to ensure optimal discharge planning. Next slide. Here's an example of a decision support table. So this is the support table that we use for the inpatient inductions. Our table for inductions in pregnancy is a little bit different, but it gives information about neonatal abstinence syndrome, preterm birth, other things that are relevant in pregnancy. Next slide. This slide is an example of our induction algorithm. So we guide people who may not have a lot of experience with buprenorphine through thinking about what how the score should lead to what action. So we walk them really step by step through the process. And of course, we include a CAUD scoring system and all the information they'll need. Next slide. Let's actually skip this slide. Next slide. So having shared an overview of our buprenorphine programs, I want to just take a minute to share some of the work we've done to ensure that our patients have access to intranasal naloxone. Uh, for opioid overdose reversal as well. And I think as Director Botticelli alluded to, many of us may be further ahead in this area right now in the hospital. Um, so about five years ago, we started prescribing naloxone to every patient on long-term opioids in our outpatient clinic. This image is from a study that we published last year showing the patients who were prescribed naloxone, the solid line, were at lower risk of presenting to the emergency room for overdose than patients who were not prescribed naloxone. That's the dotted line. So we've had a lot of success and feel really, really good about the, the practice of prescribing naloxone alongside opioids. We've even found that in our own clinic, patients who receive naloxone from their provider actually end up having lower, they end up having on average dose reductions in their opioid dose we think that something about having a conversation about naloxone actually causes the provider to think twice about the dose they're prescribing and to begin tapers more frequently. Um, so it's, it's a powerful intervention on a lot of levels. 
And so, next slide. From the outpatient setting, we spread our naloxone prescribing program to the inpatient setting, where we now provide naloxone on discharge to any patient who's at high risk for opioid overdose. We do that both in the emergency room and in the inpatient units. In the emergency room, we actually have a pharmacist who literally hands the medication to the patient before they leave and teaches them and their family how to use it. Next slide. So the next frontier for us is really launching this ED protocol. We're really excited to launch that in 2017. And for those of you who are listening and thinking about how to start programs like this on your own, in your own system, my advice is to just start somewhere. Start where there's enthusiasm and where there's skill. So maybe that's the outpatient setting, maybe that's the emergency room, maybe that's one of your hospital units, maybe it's labor and delivery. Make sure that that program that you build is well integrated with the rest of the system. Find people who can cross-pollinate and cross-silos and it will spread on its own. So rewarding to be able to help people who you haven't been able to help before. So I'll turn it over now to Dr. Bernstein to share um, an even more sort of advanced system with you. And thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kaufa. And with that, we will turn it over to Dr. Bernstein, who will present on Faster Pass programs, on the Faster Pass programs and the range of programs it interacts with at uh, Boston Medical Center. Dr. Bernstein? Thank you. Next slide. I want to thank all of you for attending this webinar, and especially thank the ONDCP staff and Director Michael Botticelli for his vision, leadership, support, and recognition of the role of our nation's hospitals and their EDs, emergency departments, uh, to address in addressing this opiate epidemic that we face. And it's gotten out of hand as well. The Faster Path to Treatment Program is a model of an addiction healthcare delivery system, a short and long-term home for people with addictions. It's an outgrowth of more than 20 years of partnership and close collaboration with our State Bureau of Substance Abuse Services, the City of Boston's Public Health Commission, and the Boston Medical Center. The program was funded by a state capacity building grant known as the Opiate Urgent Care Center with supplemental funds from the Boston Medical Center. The team that you see before us uh, includes ex waived physicians, addiction nurses, pharmacists, administrators, peer addiction counselors and recovery support specialists outside our hospital, and staff from the development office and space allocation, as well as our public sec security folks who actually save 50 lives after training with naloxone uh, education and utilization. Next slide. I'm sure we're all on the same page with this vision to provide respectful, supportive, and effective pathways to addiction services. I look at it as compassion and curiosity and patient centrality a part of what I learned years ago from, from the work on motivational interviewing. Next slide. Our mission is to integrate and enhance and fulfill gaps in the existing continuum of patient services for substance use disorder, both internally and externally. Next slide. Thank you. As I mentioned before, we've, we have integrated and collaborated over these many years with a variety of programs within our institution and outside. In our emergency department 22 years ago, we started Project Assert to improve alcohol and substance abuse services and referral to treatment. The OBAT, or Office-Based Addiction Treatment Program, and other programs like it in our hospital for adolescents, pregnancy, family medicine, and psychiatry with x wave physicians are part of our, our program. And also a inpatient addiction consult service that starts people on buprenorphine or methadone and transfers them to to our program or other programs. Uh, we've tried to achieve economies of scale and increased resources by all coming together and coordinating these services, and integration is an important concept. And I think our partnership with the community and the community services with the Public Health Commission is essential. Next slide. We, I just wanted to, to focus on our medication assisted treatment program that's a new addition. Uh, we actually had it one day a week within the uh, general in internal medicine section after people were discharged from the hospital and started on buprenorphine. But now we've continued on a daily basis during the week in, in the uh, Faster Pass clinic. And we have the support of uh, pharmacy techs who help with prior authorization and as well as on-site lab. And I, I lost my screen here. Here we go. On-site lab and uh, rapid testing. Next slide. 
you know, this is just a walkthrough, a patient. We have a space that's uh, near our urgent care emergency department, uh, and next to the lab and down the hall is the Project Assert Office with the peer education program. So patients come in and they're registered into our system, there's intake, and they're referred to the uh, licensed alcohol drug counselors for a uh, ASAM uh, sponsored triage tool to assess the level of care that they're eligible for. And then if they're interested in and qualify for outpatient uh, opiate treatment, they're referred back into the Fast to Pets um, MAC clinic and seen by the nurse and the uh, physician. Uh, a percentage of those patients need uh, more support uh, during the process of induction and stabilization and are referred to our uh, colleagues in, in, in the PATH program and the, in, on the Public Health Commission. Next, next slide. This is a, a little diagram of a complicated process. People come to our office, either drop in or referred from other agencies, but uh, many referrals come from registered in the emergency department and urgent care, from the inpatient addiction consult service, from fast to paths from PADS program and from our clinics. Uh, they receive a medical evaluation and a behavioral psychosocial evaluation. Uh, some, are, some who are interested in outpatient programs uh, refer to outpatient programs or to um, our medication assisted treatment unit. We also uh, assess their eligibility for maltrexate as well as uh, methadone versus buprenorphine. Uh, then we have the opportunity through the fast for the PATH program and the uh, Public Health Commission to refer people to transitions or clinical stabilization as well as residential and shelters. So we have a considerable population of homeless folks that, that need this additional support. Next slide. Just uh, to give you a sense of the contributions of Project Assert, uh, it was a SAMHSA grant back in 1993, picked up by the hospital in 97 as a line item. It has five FTEs. And, uh, and three um, uh, master's, degree, master's degree of peer educators, and we call them health promotion advocates. Their, their role is, is the assessment and the uh, linkage and referral, but it's basically about a warm handoff to existing treatments and linkages with uh, community partners as well in this new stage, going from the emergency department and the inpatient services, now they have built, we have built an ambulatory arm of, of our project assert staff. That is, uh, that is in the FASTA PATH program. Since its inception, we've uh, practiced here to serve over 100,000 patients. And it was the, uh, one of the early prototypes for the expert program because they do bed-to-bed -bed screening and have conversations that help motivate and navigate patients to the services they need. Next slide. Just to give you an idea of, of some of the data related to uh, the consultations by the emergency department staff for practice CERT. Uh, over 3,000 patients were assessed for, for referral to a, a detox program. Of those, half were placed that day and transportation was provided. The insurance uh, problems were addressed. And then about a quarter were denied because of no beds available or insurance problems, and a quarter refused. Next slide. So among those refusals, there were a number of folks that, there was a number of things that we could do, and we did, which was the uh, harm reduction strategy that we've applied. And in 2010, we began lots of distribution and opiate education in the emergency department. The red bars are the contribution by Project Assert uh, peers, and the other bars are by the uh, evening uh, pharmacists and residents and faculty within the emergency department. So we've seen an increase in, in all, these, um, all these aspects of the program over the years. Next slide. And we've tried to integrate the uh, overdose education and lots of distribution into the fast to pass program so that everyone who is seen in the medication assessment unit is given the Loxone Coke prescribed and Loxone with their other prescriptions. Next slide. The PATH program in the Boston Public Health Commission It used to be part of the uh, emergency department about 15, 20 years ago, and it was called Room 5. And then they, there was a, a organization in which the Public Health Commission and the hospital uh, separated, and or where we would call a merge with other hospitals. And so, so these services were not available, and we were not partnering with them 
effectively for many years, but over the last 10 years or so with VNR partnership. And this uh, grant opportunity has allowed us to hire and support uh, community support providers in their organization to help our patients with an array of, of needs. Next slide. And that includes the uh, case management, medical and social service navigation, the navigators and motivators, and build relationships with the patients that are lasting. A number of them have gone into the homes after people have overdosed, had conversations with them, and brought them into our, our program, including the MAT unit. Uh, and one of the big needs that people have in order to get their prescriptions is proper IDs. You have to have a government ID to have a prescription filled. And so that has been part of our relationship with the PATH program to acquire these IDs, as well as transportation and uh, other support. Next slide. We're about to enter a new phase where the, our external providers uh, and partners are going to be able to use our hospital record. They already have access to our hospital through the, uh, through the electronic badge, and now we're going to have them enter into our record, their assessment, as well as their follow-up, and the things that they've uh, learned in, in, in communicating with the patient, at the patient's, with the patient's permission. So we, we will basically incorporate them into our EPIC um, emergency hospital record. Electronic hospital record, I'm sorry. Next slide. I just, this is a list of the external referral network that both a project research and PATH program at the Public Health Commission have built over the years that includes acute treatment services and the transitions that I spoke about. There's a great need for housing, uh, for recovery. It's very difficult for people to recover at, at the homeless shelters. And then there are other programs that are available for, uh, for methadone that have given us uh, very easy access. Next slide. As part of the continuum of services, there are uh, not only methadone uh, programs, but also uh, residential programs and, and outpatient programs, such as the Moms Project and the Men's Renewal Program. And we have excellent relationships with, with many of the recovery programs, the resi residential programs. Next slide. So in, in summary, the fast to fast treatment has enhanced the current network that we had of providers. It acts as a central intake where people have these services available from 8 in the morning to 12 at night daily. They have the access to the medication-assisted treatment assessment uh, daily till, till 4.30 during the week. And then uh, through the, uh, a number of our office-based programs, we can transfer people that are stabilized onto maintenance method, um, maintenance buprenorphine uh, naloxone programs, or back into the primary care practice for naltrexone as well as buprenorphine um, naloxone. So we are quite fortunate to have a robust uh, network. There are still many barriers, though, for capacity to provide access. But we are fortunate to have uh, great leadership in the OBAP program that is, provides state uh, consultation and training for, for Massachusetts and, and, uh, and has trained our addiction nurse within our clinic and worked closely with us. Next slide. So some, some data that might be helpful to you to show what we've done since we opened our doors in August. We received a grant from the state for capacity building in May and by August 1st, because of the, this team that we've pulled together, was able to build this space and provide all the equipment and personnel to, to begin to work together in this program. Next slide. So a number of people have been scheduled for, for, the, for the, uh, the program, but not everybody um, makes the appointment. But 213 people did arrive and, and have their first appointment there. Among those, medications were started on 230, 223 patients. 26 patients were referred to, of this group, was referred for addiction uh, acute treatment. 17 were referred for the outpatient support. And now 36 of our patients are now in maintenance. Just to give you an example of the type of patients we see, one fellow was using 30 oxycodones, 30 milligrams each daily for every week. And he was started on suboxone he was, and on the and the naloxone. And he's, for the last four weeks, he's been doing spectacularly. And when you uh, we check his urine drug screens, there's, there's only buprenorphine in his drug screen. 
another patient, uh, since the primary care doctors staff our clinic, another patient who had elevated liver enzymes and was just admitted the week before because of a fentanyl overdose, was linked up with her primary care practice. And uh, when, he, when it turned out that he had liver failure, she was able to admit him to the hospital and then reintegrate him back into the, into the FASTA Path program. Next slide. Our referrals, as I mentioned earlier, come from the inpatient addiction consult service, walk-ins, project assert from the ED and urgent care, the PATH program from Public Health Commission, and, and various community agencies, including residential programs. And uh, we have a very close relationship with our psychiatric addiction service, and they've started groups to uh, intake groups for people that, that are qualified for uh, dual diagnosis or co-occurring co co disease uh, that require uh, buprenorphine and other medications management. Next slide. Finally, this is just a, a rough take on how many, how many uh, encounters we've had. There's almost 1,800 encounters since we opened our doors with our nurse, our physician, and our peers. Next slide. What about challenges and lessons learned? I think one of the biggest challenges was, was integrating a, pe a, a peer model with a uh, medical model. And I think that's an important, that's an important asset that we have, the, the support services and the relationships that peers can build with, the, with, with our patients are critical. At the same time, the, the medications that we have to offer really support people's recovery and offer them options that they didn't have before. We've gone from a grant to actually implementing a program in four months, and the lessons, the most challenging things was to get the space that we needed because our emergency department and urgent care sites are very expensive for people to use and they have high co-payments, and we have a site now that, that will have reduced costs. We, we needed really a, a close relationship with our IT department to build both the assessments in, in our uh, electronic hospital record as well as, um, as the scheduling system. I think one of the big, big helps has been the pharmacy that's, that's helped us overcome some of the barriers for people getting medication. And now we're working on getting a waiver for our clinical space because there's not a billing space at the present time. Next slide. And I think all of us face the lack of capacity outside uh, our doors, and I think that one of the challenges is making sure that people go from the, the bridge program of of our medication-assisted treatment to the, a medication maintenance program in the community or within our hospital. And we need more, more, we need a greater workforce development in order to do this as well as funding. I think the other challenge is to provide services the same day and we, we're not funded to provide services beyond the week, weekdays. And that's been a very uh, challenging problem because people want treatment on demand and they deserve it. I think uh, the, the last thing I think I would say is that the mental health services that people need are, aren't always available, and we have to continue to work with our behavioral health section to provide them. And I, I think one of the challenges have been to, to uh, balance the need for assessment and triage um, information tools and intake tools and all the information we collect with, with the needs of patient care. Uh, next slide. Yes, thank you very much for, for everything you've uh, You've been uh, doing out in the field and for the help of ONDCP and all my colleagues, and it's an honor to be among them in presenting today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. And with that, we're going to uh, hand the uh, mic over to Dr. Sarah Wakeman, who will provide an overview of the efforts that she's leading under the Substance Use Disorder Initiative at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. Great. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to Dr. Botticelli for uh, your leadership and vision, and to everyone for participating today. Um, so in this last uh, bit of time that we have together, I want to tell you a little bit about our hospital's efforts to address substance use disorder across the care continuum. Next slide. So the attention from our hospital on this issue really came out of our commitment to our communities. Every three years, we conduct a community health needs assessment where we survey the community members that um, that we care for and ask them what is most important to them in terms of their health or, or their life more generally. And since 2012, loud and clear, our communities have been telling us that substance use is the single greatest priority to them, more than crime, more than other health conditions, more even than housing. And so the hospital heard this, and as our general health care system is moving towards thinking about caring better for populations, 
of patients and, and managing chronic disease, um, this came at a time when the hospital was ready to make a commitment to identify addiction as the single greatest clinical priority in our ongoing strategic plan. When we began this work, we really started by looking at what was wrong with the existing system. And across many general medical settings, uh, the current system had been that we did a great job at treating acute problems. So patients could come in with acute medical complications from their underlying substance use disorder, an infection related to injection drug use, or an exacerbation of liver disease due to chronic alcohol use disorder. And we would treat that acute medical complication and maybe provide short-term stabilization for the underlying substance use. But we often wouldn't address the chronic disease of addiction, and we would send patients back to the circumstances that made them sick in the first place without offering them the evidence-based treatment that they needed to get well. And so as we began to think about care we design across our system, we realized that we needed to develop a model that really matched the best evidence that we have of how to treat addiction as chronic, treatable, but relapsing disease with how we designed our system. And I'll take you through the different components of our model. Next slide. In the hospital setting, we started an addiction consult team. And so in the same way that if a patient has a heart attack, they really deserve to see a team of cardiologists and, and, and cardiac specialists. Now if a patient has an overdose, they suffer from endocarditis due to injection heroin use, they'll see a team of addiction experts at the bedside during that hospitalization. This team is multidisciplinary, and in fact, everything we do across the care system is multidisciplinary. It includes uh, physicians, both from medicine and psychiatry, nurse practitioners, social workers, a clinical pharmacist, a resource specialist, and importantly, trainees, both medical students, um, medical residents, psychiatry residents, and, and anesthesia, pain, medicine, health. Our philosophy is really that treatment, uh, that hospitalization, hospitalization is a reachable moment, that patients are literally experiencing the negative consequences of their illness, and no patient wants to be in a hospital bed dealing with some terrible medical complications from their substance use disorder. And so it's actually a really fantastic time to focus first and foremost on how we can improve the quality of life for patients that we take care of. And that centers around identifying patients. We now do universal screening across the hospital. And then our team really focuses first on engagement and motivational enhancement, because as a general hospital, most patients are not coming to us asking for addiction treatment. They're coming to us asking for help with their medical problem, um, their acute exacerbation of the medical issue that got them hospitalized. So we focus on engagement at the bedside, and our social workers can do motivational work right there at the bedside. And rapid initiation of medication treatment. We know from um, decades of research that early initiation of pharmacotherapy, both for opioid and alcohol use disorder, is effective and increases the likelihood of success. And so we try our best to start medication during that hospitalization. But even with fantastic care in the hospital, addiction is a chronic disease, and a five to seven day hospitalization will never be enough time to really provide treatment. And so the most important piece of what we do in the hospital is to directly link people into ongoing treatment uh, that will occur immediately after they leave the hospital. Fine. Our team began just on eight medical floors and has since expanded across the entire thousand bed hospital with the exclusion of pediatrics. Um, so we're on medicine, surgery, obstetrics, uh, and um, all of the other services. We've now seen 2,259 consults, which uh, amounts to 1,793 unique patients. Because as a general hospital, a patient actually can't be admitted for a primary purpose of, um, of an opiate use disorder. The majority of our patients are still alcohol use disorder, and, and it's important to recognize even in the opioid crisis that the morbidity and mortality of alcohol use disorder. But you can see that about 28% of our patients have opioid use disorder. We've studied this model. We have ongoing research, which has shown that, that this is quite effective in not only engaging patients, but actually in their post-discharge outcomes related to addiction. And we found that there's statistically significant decrease in the severity of individual drug use measured by the Addiction Severity Index, and an increase in the number of days they're able to stay abstinent in the 30 days after when we compare them to matched patients who don't have access to the consult team. Next slide. As I mentioned, starting medication uh, is a crucial intervention in the hospital. And prior to um, the, having this consult service, you can see the majority of patients did not receive medications during their hospitalization. And the figure on the right, you can see now that more than half of patients are started on a medication treatment for alcohol use disorder or opioid use disorder. Next slide. 
As um, you heard Dr. Bernstein mentioned, one of the challenges is lack of access to community treatment programs. And so we knew from the start that it was crucial for us to start treatment in the hospital, including medications like buprenorphine. And yet in many communities, the wait time to get uh, buprenorphine maintenance can be months long. And so from the beginning, we knew we would need a, a solution to that. And so we started what we call our bridge clinic, which is a transitional clinic that functions both as an urgent care model and also as a bridge between the hospital or the emergency room and ongoing care in the community. So we follow people for weeks to months, however long it takes for them to get linked into care in the community. And it, uh, as the consult team is, it's a multidisciplinary approach. And it also includes a recovery coach or a peer who's in recovery herself, who's a member of our team. We provide medication, maintenance, peer support, groups, uh, we have a clinical pharmacist, and then referral linkage to outside treatment and social services. We've also started an exciting pilot with our emergency department where we can see patients after an overdose once they're medically stabilized and start them on medications that same day, including buprenorphine. Our bridge clinic has seen about 200 patients. Um, but as with the Faster Pass program, that accounts for almost 2,000 visits, a very high patch, and the majority of our patients are seen more than once. You can see there's a range in the number of visits, but a quarter of our patients are seen 10 or more times, and about half are seen five or more times. The median number of days the patients are followed with us is about two months, and during that time, we're actively working to link them into care in the community. You can see that most patients have had a same-day visit or a walk-in visit, which I think really highlights the needs of this population to have a flexible model where they're not going to show up to appointment-based scheduling, and it's really important for us to welcome them with open arms whenever they do show. Next slide. In our outpatient settings, starting in our community health centers, we've developed teams of addiction champions that, again, are multidisciplinary. Our philosophy throughout this model is that people don't fail treatment, and if a person is not doing well in treatment, it's because the treatment has failed that person. And it's really on our care teams to think about a new treatment plan for that individual. We've increased access to medication treatments. We now have 36 later buprenorphine prescribers in our health centers alone, as well as digital injection clinics and um, expanded counseling services. Our teams meet at least twice a month to talk about challenging cases with the input of addiction specialists so that we can support primary care teams and caring for these patients in their primary care clinics um, and getting the resources and the input that they feel they need to do this care well. We've integrated recovery coaches across the system, and I'll talk more about that next, and we've collaborated with community partners who are also delivering important addiction treatment. Next slide. Our recovery coaches have been a, a total game changer. We have eight amazing individuals who are themselves in long-term recovery from substance use disorder. And they've seen more than 800 patients, which is amount of almost 8,000 coach contacts. So they are literally there for whatever it is that the patient needs. Their active case load ranges from about 43 to 75. And a study we did of our patients um, really demonstrated the incredible value of these individuals, that their shared life experience allows them to connect with patients in a way that the traditional medical system never could. Um, they improve patient experience. They facilitate access to much-needed social service um, and provide incredible ongoing social support. Next slide. And then lastly, I think one of the greatest challenges for us and for all healthcare systems and, and individuals who care about this issue and who are try, trying to create change is really addressing culture and stigma, that we know addiction is the most stigmatized health condition on earth, um, according to the World Health Organization. And so one of the many reasons people don't come into care and one of the many reasons people experience poor care is because of stigma that's inherent. The quote on top is from a young woman who had left a number of hospitals against medical advice because she felt that she was being treated poorly and was ultimately able to stay and get the medical care that she needed simply because she felt she wasn't being stigmatized. In addition to addressing stigma head-on, we found in serving physicians that having access to clinical resources and feeling not powerless but like they have teams to call on and services that they can use to help their patients actually um, impacts stigma and culture. And that physicians who had a patient receive care from our initiative found caring for patients with substance use disorder more satisfying. They have less negative attitudes towards substance use disorder and its treatment. And they felt more prepared and more likely to both diagnose and treat substance use disorder based on people. Next slide. 
So as we reach the top of the hour, I want to thank all of you for participating, but I also want to mention that I am just one member of a very large team that's dedicated to this issue at Mass General and um, wonderful partnerships with our community providers. And here are some photos of um, some of our leadership team, and there are many, many others across MGH and across the greater Massachusetts area that have been really instrumental in getting this work done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wakeman, and, and thank you to all our presenters. Uh, as I mentioned at the opening of the session today, our presenters and other national experts were kind enough to make themselves available for informal consultation. If you'd like to discuss how to best implement similar approaches in your hospital or community, please email us at the address shown on the slide, recoveryrsvp at ondcp.eop.gov. We will put you in touch with our team of experts. We work to ensure that the presentations answered as many as possible of the questions you submitted when registering. If you submitted a question that was not answered or if you have new questions, please feel free to submit them to the same email address. With that, we'd like to thank you, to thank our extraordinary presenters and to thank each of you for joining us today. We hope you found this session valuable and will take steps to implement similar approaches in your hospital or community. This concludes our webinar on addressing opioid overdose and opioid use disorder through hospitals. <laughs>